So in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 13, it says, you are salt of the earth. And it says, if salt has lost its taste, then how then shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, when I think about that verse where Jesus is preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, I'm kind of reminded that, okay, God is saying to us that we are salt and light of the earth and that we are here for a purpose. Because I have a feeling there that God is saying to us, well, he doesn't really want to throw out the salt. He wants to use us as those who would preserve things, those who would make things sweet and make things good. You know, Pastor Toppy, he preached to us last week so beautifully about what it means to, uh, what evangelism is and how we should evangelize. And in there, he broke it down for us. And toward the end there, he would have spoken about what we should do. And as I was thinking about today's sermon, I think it's important for us to know practically how we should do those things. Because I think there's a, a way that we need to learn how to evangelize so that we are able to reach the lost. So that's the title of today's sermon. It's called Reaching the Lost. At the end of uh, Pastor Toppy's sermon last week, he basically made reference to us being obedient to the Spirit. And as, as children of God, we need to be obedient to the Spirit, we need to be listening to what the Spirit is saying to us to help us in our evangelical efforts as we come to people who do not know Christ to open their hearts to what God will do through them and in them. So I thought we'd just start off by learning about what the basics of evangelism is. So there on your first point in your notes, you'll see it there, the basics of evangelism. And in understanding what the basics of evangelism is, we have to understand that the gospel is good news, not bad news. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Because probably like myself, you, you've been in situations where there's people you know, like friends or family or even those you don't know, and they'll come up to you and they'll say, do you want the good news first or the bad news? You've been there, right? I've been there many times. And I know 99% of the time, we're all going to say, give us the bad news first, right? Because we want to know the bad news, so when the good news comes, we're like, yay, there is something good to celebrate. So the guy will come up to you and they'll say, yeah, you know what, this is the bad news, and, and you're kind of like, okay, give me the good news. So they give you the good news, and then that good news, it overpowers any bad news. Because now, that good news has filled you up. That good news makes you feel good. And this is what the gospel is. The gospel is good news that Jesus came down as man. He came down as man and he lived the life that we should have lived. And he died the death that we should have died. It may come up on the screen for you. He lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we should have died in our place. Three days later, he rose from the dead proving he is the son of God. And in proving he's the son of God, he offered the gift of salvation and forgiveness of sins to everyone who would believe in him. And that is the good news. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we understand the gospel, we understand it's good news. And if you was here last week, you would have seen the video that was played to you about the man who was there preaching the gospel of Jesus. And he was there and as he's preaching... You know, he's got good intentions, but the words that are coming out of his mouth are really kind of, it, it, it's, it's sounding bad. And even a woman that he was speaking to, I mean, she wasn't a Christian, but she was quoting scripture. She was saying, doesn't the Bible say that, that we should love our neighbor? You may remember that. And the guy couldn't really say anything. Although he had the good intentions, it was making something good look bad. And that's why we, in understanding what the gospel is, and that is good news, we have received that gift. We've received the gift of the gospel, the gift of salvation. So we take that gift, and when we go out and evangelize, it's like we're taking that gift and we're giving it to those who don't know Christ. And they will take that gift of salvation and they will embrace it and embrace the good news and they will pass it on to someone else and pass it on to someone else. That's how those who are added to the kingdom of God, amen? 
So the first basics there is the gospel is good news, not bad news. And alongside that, it's important that we understand that Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. That's important. I think when we think about that in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says there, but to all who did receive him, he gave the right for them to become children of God. And when you think about that, it's, it's speaking about Jesus Christ being our father. He's been our father and we are in relationship with him. And therefore we get to call him Abba Father. So if we can understand that it's about us being in a relationship and not a religion, then other people will see the good in that. Because I've been in situations where I, I was with somebody, um, quite recently actually, and, and they were speaking to somebody who didn't know Christ. And they were speaking about, you know, different things to do with Christianity and, and religion and so on. But all the words that they were saying to this guy, I could see he looked confused. Because he was thinking, okay, well, it all sounds quite religious. So I was there, quite, a, quite an introverted at that moment. But I was thinking to myself, when the time's right, I've got to save this guy. So I waited for the right moment and I, and I came in there and just said, listen, aside of all that, my faith is based upon my relationship with Jesus. That's where everything is built. And I could see in that moment that he was happier because it wasn't religious, it was relationship based. And he kind of liked that and it helped the whole conversation. It helped to calm things down. You see, when we share our faith, we have to be careful that we're not saying, oh, come and join my church but more, come and meet my Christ. Amen? Amen. Not come and meet, oh look, there's a place for inviting people to church. Oh, of course there is. Because when there's a special event going on and things are happening, it's, it's good to invite people to church. They need to come to church, but they're not coming to church, yes, to join the church, but they're coming to meet our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who saved us and redeemed us from the pit and brought us in to his marvellous light. Amen? We serve a good God, don't we? I think for me, I'm so happy that I get to be in relationship with the living Saviour. And I think about the basics again, and I have to remind myself these things. Because if we are to follow these basics, we also need to know that when we're sharing and when we're evangelising, evangelism, evangelism is by love, not by force. That's important. I think you're in danger sometimes of, of people who are very forceful. Now, you see our friend Peter in the Bible. He was a funny guy because he had the, there were some situations where he would say the wrong thing and he would do the wrong thing, even though he'd been walking with Jesus for a number of years. And if you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, I think it's in John chapter 18, you see there that it's the time where Jesus is about to be arrested. And in being arrested, he, the, the soldier comes to Jesus, and as he comes to arrest Jesus, instead of Peter saying, please don't do it, Peter draws for his sword, and he pulls it out, and he cuts the ear off the soldier. I mean, this is not the way to display Christ. Because he's done that, and Jesus has said in that moment, okay, put your sword down. Those who live by the sword, die by the sword. But Jesus would basically say, look, you've been with me for these few years. You know how I live. You know that everything I did was by love. So we need to calm things down. When he met Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he was kind to him. He showed love. When he met the woman who was committing adultery, what did he do? He showed love. Because he gave the example to us that we are to evangelize by love and not by force. So those are the basics of evangelism. I think if we can remember those things, I think it will help us in our evangelical efforts. I really do believe that. But alongside the basics, there are some practical things I believe that we can do to help us when sharing our faith, when preaching the gospel to people. 
So I think it's important for us to understand the art of evangelism. How to, how do I evangelize? Because some of us are real good at it. But some of us are a little bit more introverted, so find this thing a little bit difficult. You may remember a few years back, there was a, a guy who came to the church. His name was Rice Brooks. Any of you remember him? Yeah. And he came over that weekend and he shared with us uh, the gospel. He was, he's a great evangelist, fantastic evangelist. Passed up his friend, bought him, uh, he brought him here and he did an amazing thing. He told us about this particular method that he uses, that he devised, which he shares with people on university campuses and so on. And this method is called the SALT method. Some of you may remember it. And I thought that would be really helpful for us to understand and know what this SALT method is and kind of break down the acronym of each letter to help us in our evangelical efforts. Okay? So the first letter you have there is S which is start a conversation, okay? Start a conversation. So this, this, this ring here, that, this means I'm married, okay? As some of you may know. I've been married for a number of years, and before I was married, I would have been single. <laughs> hey! <laughs> and... When I first joined the church, I think it was the beginning of 2010, I joined the church and I was a single man, you know, the good Christians sit in the front, you know, Bible on the lap and all sorts of things. And, and, and I was there attentive and there was an alpha course that was taking place at the time. So I thought, okay, you know, the good Christian guy, I want to grow in the Lord. Let me join this alpha course. So I joined the alpha course and I'm there at the front and Pastor Dave's teaching there and, and then somebody walks in. So I'm like, who is this in my head? I think she looks nice. Now, I'm not there for the girls, by the way. I'm there to grow. Hallelujah. So I've seen her. And I'm in the front row, you know, the good guy. She sits on the row behind me. There's a guy situated behind me. And I'm thinking, OK, if I speak to this guy, maybe I'll get her attention. So I start a conversation with this guy, not really that interested in him, more interested in her. <laughs> so my eyes on him, but I've got my, my right eye on her. And I'm chatting, I'm smiling, hoping she pays attention, but she doesn't. <laughs> I know, it's sad, but I'm like, hey, 10 weeks to go. It's the alpha course. <laughs> so I might still be in there. My wife's sitting this day thinking, oh no. So next week comes, I'm thinking, okay, how do I do this thing? Okay, look. I'm not shy like that. I'm, 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 I'm quite an extrovert, but there's moments I can be an introvert. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I see her again, and I'm thinking, oh, this is it. So she's with a group of friends. I'm thinking, uh-oh, do I be bold and go up to all of them, or do I wait? <laughs> but I'm like, I'm going for it. So there's four girls, four ladies there, and I walk over, you know, try a little, you know, walk over. <laughs> if you know me, I've got a funny kind of walk, so I walk over. And I see them, and I'm talking to these ladies, kind of going, oh, you know, how are you? Everything OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But really, I'm not really interested in those three. It's more like Claire I'm interested in. <laughs> so I go around, and we, we have a chat. And then, you know, we, I start a conversation. But then I mention something about I'm being baptized next week. Bingo. I didn't know the effect that would have because she was really interested in my baptism, but I was really interested in her. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, darling. So I, we end up having a conversation, and then roll on years later, we're now married, and we have a child who's in champions right now, seven years old. We thank God for what he does. But the reason I tell that story is because I had to sum up something to start a conversation. That was really important because if I didn't start a conversation, there's no way I'd be married right now to Claire. <laughs> <laughs> to Claire, that is. But listen, conversation starters can be difficult. But I will give you a tip. The best day to start a conversation is a Monday. <laughs> and you're thinking, why Monday? Well, I'll tell you, if you work, 
Now you get what? If you work on a Monday, you know what you did on a Sunday. So you go to work and you see this person who you've been wanting to speak to and you go up to them. You're like, morning, how are you? Are you okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. How was your weekend? Oh, you know where this is going. Because if they're not heartless, they're going to ask you, how was your weekend? And now your chest is high. Now you know you've got access granted. Because you can now say, oh, yeah, everything was well. Saturday, you know, I was with my wife and daughter. We went to the museum. And then on Sunday, oh, yeah. Sunday, I went to church. But you don't start quoting the sermons and scriptures like that, no. You kind of let them know you went to church, you had a good time, and you drip feed that thing. And over time, you'll be able to open up a little bit more about the church. Oh, so you told me about church, so, so where is your church? Uh, okay, Enfield. And now you're asking, now they're asking more questions to you, now you're able to be open. There's an open door for you. So remember that tomorrow when you go to work, yeah, try it. Even if you don't want to ask the weekend, ask them about the weather. Oh, some people hate it, some people love it. Most times people hate it because sometimes when it's hot, they're moaning. When it's cold, they're moaning. You can't win. But it's a good conversation starter. Because I've been there. When it's quiet and you're like, oh, this is an awkward moment. I just go, ugh. <sighs> a bit cold today, isn't it? <laughs> and, they, and they go, yeah, I guess so. I hate the cold. Yeah, me too. Now I'm rolling. Now I'm rolling. I'm going to drip feed some things in over time with this specific person. You could be in a shop, anything. You could be in a shop having a conversation. It's important if we know how to start a conversation, that's where it all begins. You see, Philip, in Acts chapter 8, huh, he knew what to do. Because you see, spirit, um, you see Philip, the angel of the Lord said to him, Philip, go to the road to Jerusalem and Gaza. And he said, when you get there, the spirit will tell you what to do. So this, he's there and the spirit says to him, go over to that chariot. Now, I love Philip. He don't waste time. The Bible says that he ran to the chariot. He was keen. And he ran over to the chariot and then he heard him saying, reading a scripture. And then he said to him, do you understand what you are reading? That's the first thing that he asked. Do you understand what you are reading? And then the door opened for conversation. And thereby a conversation ensued and then you will see the results of that a bit later. That's how you do it. Start a conversation. And then once you start a conversation, we then have to adapt our approach. You've got to adapt your approach. You can't have the same approach with everyone you speak to. Everybody is different. Because you have to be sensitive to what that person is like. You've got to adapt your approach. Because in order to share our faith effectively, when we can figure out, okay, what's this person like? Listening to the things that they're saying to you. What is this person like? Because there's, this, there's about three categories of different people that we could come into contact with. The first could be those who are hostile. You know those people, right? I mean, they're, they're so hostile, they're like anti-Christ, anti-God, anti-church, anti-everything. And no matter how many conversations you have with this person, you can't break through. And sometimes it can be frustrating. Sometimes for you, it can be frustrating to the point where you actually start to argue with that person. And that's unhelpful. Because like it was said, evangelism is by love, not by force. So getting involved in these disputes, you know what Jesus did? He said, those who don't want to welcome you to the house, he just said this. Shake the dust off your feet and move on. Because there's some that we can't get through to. That's the hostile one. And then you have those who are indifferent. Now, these ones that are indifferent, these are the kind of people who, they've never really thought about the faith. They've never really thought about 
religion, but then they're, they're open to it. They're kind of open to it a little bit. And we have to see what those people, what, what type of person is that? The indifferent one. Because those ones, it can be like you're in conversation with them and they start talking about their life and, and things that they're going through and then you kind of just say to them, oh yeah, 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 I used to be like that until something happened. Oh. Now they want to know what it was that happened. Now you have it in. They want to know what happened to you. How comes you was like this once, but now you are like this? And now you get to share some things with that person. You see, they're indifferent. They haven't thought about it, but they're waiting for someone like you and I to go up to them and let them know about our saviour. They're indifferent. But there are also those who are seekers. And they are the ones who you know... <laughs> You could be at work and you might receive an email. And they'll be like, listen, can you pray for me? I've had that before. Yeah, we see that you, yeah, we can see that you're kind of different now. Can we do lunch? Oh, of course we could do lunch. Let's go. Because that person is the person who is seeking something they don't even know, but you know what they're seeking. They're seeking someone who will fill the void in their heart. And that's what it's like for all of us. There was something missing and we found him. Actually, he found us. And thereby, we started to build a relationship. You see, Philip, when he was at the chariot, he asked the eunuch what he was reading. And he responded. The eunuch responded and said that he really didn't understand what he was reading unless someone is to guide him. He needed someone to guide him. And you know what? Philip was just the right man to do that for him. And he invited him up into the chariot. You see, Philip, he adapted his approach. He started the conversation, he adapted his approach, but also, more importantly, he was listening. That's the third one there. Listening to the Spirit. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there that can talk. And they can talk. And they can talk. And they can talk. And you're just thinking, please let me say something. But the person they're evangelizing to, they can't get a word in edgeways. You see? The spirit, when you're in those conversations, sometimes we have to be sensitive to what the spirit is saying to us about them. Because I know when I'm in a conversation and I'm just asking the spirit in my mind, Lord, what would you have me say at this time? You know we can pray in the spirit, right? We can pray in our mind. That's what we do. It's important for us to listen to the spirit, but also listen to what they're saying. So we can pick up the pain, pick up the concerns. You know when you ask someone, how are you? And they go, yeah, I'm not too bad. You go, oh, cool, all right, take care. <laughs> if you had really listened to how they said, yeah, I'm okay, you could probably pick up there's some pain there. There's something, there's some pain there. Maybe they want you to ask them, can you pray for me? Can you pray for them? Because that's, again, another open door for you to go through. Be one who would listen to the Spirit and listen to those you are speaking to. And finally, tell your story. Start a conversation, adapt your approach, listen to the Spirit, now tell your story. And some of you are thinking, okay, so, you know, Leo, I, I don't really have a story as such. I, I grew up in a Christian home and I haven't really been through anything. But let me tell you, your life was pre-planned before the creation of the world. God knew what your life would be like. God says that your story is significant. 
because God is in the business of bringing people around you that need to hear your story. Amen? Amen. That's why it's important for us to tell our story, share our story. You see, just like you guys have a story, I also have my own story. You see, before my second birthday, I lost my father, my dad, to suicide. He, he took his own life. He poured petrol over himself and set himself alight. He went up in flames. Now, that was a rocky start for me, a rocky start for my mum also, who would have found things real difficult at that time of life. And, and growing up, I knew that he had died, but I didn't know the way that he had died until I got to around 15, 16. And I think around that time, it was difficult for me because I think I, it was hard for me to process that at that age. And that point there, you know, I grew up in a Christian home. My mum, she met someone else years later, who I now call dad, and, and he introduced my mum to the faith. And I grew up in a Christian home, but when I got to that 15, 16 years old, I decided at that point, I didn't want to go to church anymore. And then I went into the world, and I got involved in so many different things. I was smoking, I was drinking, I was girls here, there, everywhere. I, I started to do sort of class A drugs. I was dealing drugs and, and the whole lot. And time moved on. And I got to around 32 years old. All these years have passed by and I've been invited to come to church over the years but I didn't really take up many invitations. And then one day I came and I was, as I was coming, there were some sermons that were being preached by specifically Pastor Toppy where I felt it was speaking into my life. And kind of saying not to play games with God, that there was going to be a change that was going to take place. And a specific day I came, I was sitting in this screen. Well, I think it was his screen, or screen eight, actually. Years ago, screen eight. And I was sitting right at the back, and I said, this day I'm going to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to wait for the altar call to come. But this day, it never came. And I was like, oh, what do I do? Do I do it? Do I not? And as I stood up, I felt something come over me and I started to cry and I welled up and the tears were coming out of my eyes I couldn't control it I went to the premier bar and saw Pastor Toppy there he took my hand and I said the salvation prayer and I gave my life to Christ on that day Woo! you know 10 years on I find myself which is very strange to me standing here preaching the word of God in this church. And my wife is in this church. We got married in this church. My daughter's in this church. I'm so thankful to God for what he does in people's lives. That's why it's important to share your story. The last point is this. The results of evangelism. The good thing is that the results are not down to you. <laughs> they're not down to you they're down to the spirit of God because in John chapter 16 verse 8 it says there when he comes he will convict the world of sin and righteousness you just got to do your part because our job is to preach the gospel unashamedly because when we do that it's the spirit who brings conviction it's the spirit who brings conversion. And it's the spirit who brings continuation. So conviction by the spirit, conversion by the spirit, and continuation with the spirit. As long as we do our part to preach the word of God to those who don't know Christ. In closing today, as I was running through some thoughts with Pastor Toppy during the week, you see this man here, the Ethiopian eunuch? You see, he heard the gospel and he was changed. He, he was saved and, and he was baptized and he went back to Ethiopia. And when he went back to Ethiopia, he shared the gospel even more there. And, and history has it that this guy here 
was the one who was responsible for all the Coptic churches that were planted around that time and through the years in Ethiopia. And I know that there's still some Coptic churches there today. You see, we've been called to be witnesses, that we would spread out the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's Acts chapter 1 verse 8. If we would be obedient to the Spirit, if we would walk in line with the basics of evangelism and be passionate to do what he tells us to do, like, Apollos said, like Paul said, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. Let us be obedient to the Spirit and walk in line with these things and do the will of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Pastor Dave.